Hello and welcome to Orthonor Cal Educational Webinar Series. We hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and enjoying the sun outside. Uh, my name is Leah Rutinov. I will be the moderator for today's webinar, and I am honored to host this event together with Dr. Nicholas Abidi, who's a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon within Orthonor Cal. Today's webinar topic is common foot and ankle problems, and it's intended for patient and healthcare professional education only. We will have Q&A session after Dr. Abidi's presentation. So if you have any questions, please send those over to us using your Q&A button uh, or chat button at the bottom of your screen. If you have any additional questions after the webinar, you can always email us at info at orthonorcal.com or call uh, directly to the office at 831-245-4024. With all that being said, I'd like to welcome Dr. Abidi. Welcome, Dr. Abidi. Thanks, Leah. Um, thank, I want to thank everybody for uh, taking time out of their day on MLK Day to attend this, and I hope that you find it useful. Certainly, we enjoy giving these, and um, Leah can answer questions afterwards. We'll be happy to take email questions afterwards, and if they're individual to the patient, we'd rather answer, answer them individually uh, if possible, but if they're general questions and we can handle them at the end, we'll be happy to do that. So again, thanks again for taking time out. So we'll go through now in terms of what we um, believe um, are some of the basic orthopedic foot and ankle problems uh, that we come upon and how you can handle them uh, by yourself or with the help of a healthcare professional. So the foot's pretty complicated. It's um, 26 bones and 40 joints and most people take their mobility for granted um, until there's a problem. And uh, on average, people are about five to 10,000 steps per day when they ambulate, but the foot's pretty complicated actually as opposed to the hip or the knee, which are just two, three bones, the uh, foot has a lot more complexity to it. So when we look at um, the common problems we're gonna talk about today is bunions, hammer toes, what's the Morton's neuroma, heel pain, plantar fasciitis, ankle sprains, posterior tibial tendonitis, and then also um, ankle arthritis and uh, diabetic foot and ankle problems. The most important thing you can do is wear a good shoe. So no matter what the problem is, for starters, a lot of it can be solved by wearing the appropriate shoes. The shoes prevent injury? Absolutely. And this is an example of a new shoe developed by Nike. In the last two, three years, Nike, New Balance, and ASIC, and uh, Hoka have gone wild with competing against each other for marathon runners, but also those shoes are available to the general public. And they generally have 3D printed foam, and sometimes the carbon graphite in between. So this is a stiff shank and a rocker bottom with a lot of cushioning. This reduces the amount of stress across your foot and ankle, but there are three different type of shoes in terms of the support that are given. Not all shoes are the same, but this construction on the outside can look the same. We'll talk about what makes them different on the inside here in a second. So what's a good shoe? A shoe, as we talked about, has a wider forefoot and a narrower heel and uh, has a lot of cushioning. It can be a dress shoe like the ones in the middle here which aren't too bad, the heels are a little bit high there, or it can be a recreational shoe. Hoka, Brooks, and New Balance have competed with each other like we've talked about, but other manufacturers like Nao, Dansko, Johnston & Murphy, and Abeo are also competing for that space as well. So just look at the characteristics that we're gonna talk about, and that is the anatomy of a running shoe includes things like the outer sole, the shank that we talked about, the rocker bottom and the forefoot, and then the upper. The upper part of the shoe should be wider to accommodate the foot, and again, this, this cushioning is really important through the manufacturing. In the heel on the inside, the, the midsole and the inside of the shoe here, the medial post determines if it's a high arch shoe, a medium arch shoe, or a low arch shoe. And the higher arch shoe is required for people who have a really flat foot and require more support for pathological reasons. But most people could be in what's called a stability shoe, not necessarily a motion control shoe. And people of a very high arch need less uh, support and more cushioning because they have a naturally reasonable arch. All shoes are going to provide some support, but the inner part of the shoe called the insole is really important because manufacturers don't always include a good insert. So when we look at this diagram, this is a right leg. This is a neutral foot and in someone's right leg when they over pronate, their foot is really flat. They need to have more arch support built into the sole of the shoe as well as the insert. When people have a very high arch, they create what's called supination. They need more cushioning to avoid creating stress in the ankle and the hind foot and the tendons, which result in rupturing of those, those items later on. 
Severe overpronation can be pediatric in nature or can be due to a ruptured tendon, which we'll talk about in a second. But this is a right foot diagram, just so you're aware of that. When we look at the shoe and someone pronates, they wanna have a stability shoe. If they're overpronating and they have a really, really low arch due to many reasons, a motion control shoe may be better for them. Like we talked about, that's got more arch support. A cushioning shoe for a supinator is more appropriate and that provides shock absorption and prevents things like stress fracture or rupture of the tissues around the ankle and the hind foot. So this is really important when you go in that you understand if you have a moderate, mild flat foot or a severe flat foot, where you have a really high arch, this is really key to talk to the shoe people about. And generally good running shoe stores and um, shoe stores that specialize in orthopedic shoes or just work-related shoes, they'll understand this, this concept and take a look at you when you stand or your physician can do that uh, when they see you and outline what type of shoe would be best for you. That's important for your career, for athletics, for your knee, for your back, for many different things, but mostly to get the right shoe on the right foot is very important. We can also lace the shoes alternatively. If someone has hammer toes, you can use this shoelace and diagram of a crisscross, and that kind of lifts up the toe box a little bit. The heel slipping also, you can lock the shoe into place so it doesn't slip as much by lacing this crisscross pattern and making sure you cinch it up at the top so you're not sliding around your heel. When someone has a really high arch or a supinated foot and they have paint the top of their foot due to arthritis, you can skip a lace on the sides and, and not put pressure on the top of the foot when you have a really high arch just by skipping it on the sides here and actually not even crossing over this area, but going up to the spot where it's open and not putting pressure on the top of the arch. That's by skipping, skipping a spot. To determine what shoe works the best for people, we have them step onto a piece of paper and draw the outline of their foot. And if they're trying to get this kind of a foot and this kind of a high heeled shoe, it's not gonna work. It's gonna create a deformity, lead to bunions and other forefoot problems over time. In the 60s and 70s, and even the 80s a little bit, people were wearing shoes like this, but not so much nowadays. If you can fit inside the diagram, then the shoe's okay for you. And there are a lot of dress shoes that you can do that, even shoes that look like they're attractive that aren't necessarily too clunky uh, to be able to do that. But you know, when someone has a really tight shoe, it's gonna deform their foot eventually and result in problems over time. So what is a bunion? A bunion is a hallux valgus in Latin, and that's where the big toe deviates, but also the top of the arch, the ligament support goes away. And so this space opens up at the top of the arch, creating a bunion like this in most cases. In some cases, it's just a big bump here, but that's not the majority. When people develop bunions, usually it's because their arch changes and their foot changes. When people are younger, in, in teenage years and they present, that's more of a genetic abnormality, and they still have an, an alternative shape to their foot. And if you talk to their parents, they had it as well. When people are older, it's usually due to shoes or the fact that their ligaments changed or they had an injury at some point, creating a deformity in the foot. These type of shoes, which have a seam on top, these cross trainers hurt those patients. They cross over on the big toe and they're really tight leather. A cloth upper would be better for this type of patient to be able to stretch out over the bunion and prevent pain and callus formation and corns from forming. So patients who have bunions, if they have a little bit of an arch support, if you have a big toe problem and an accommodative shoe, that really gets rid of a lot of those issues. In addition to some of the stuff we'll talk about in a minute, hammer toes and aromas, it accommodates that as well. There are a hundred different type of bunion operations depending on the type of deformity someone presents with. So it's not really the normal thing to say, hey, I just need to have the bump shaved off. It really depends on the standing x-rays that are obtained and when the deformity developed over what period of time was it due to genetics or was it due to a trauma or was it due to post-pregnancy even? And so we address the problem at what's called the apex of the deformity. All these lines are designed to be able to take the bone into consideration at the place where it's the most deformed. And that's how we design the surgery for the patients. And then there's some soft tissue procedures that go on top of that. But again, that depends on the deformity and where it arises from and how it developed. So it's a same day surgery. We usually make people numb from the knee down, make them sleepy. They come and go to the same day. They can't put weight on the forefoot generally for about six weeks. They can walk on the heel after about two to three weeks. And we see them back in the office every two weeks to change the dressings. Uh, they'll have swelling for about three to six months for any foot and ankle surgery and back to normal activities depending on the degree of surgery that's necessary between three and six months. This is what a normal x-ray would look like in a, a bunion patient with an apex deformity up here in what we call the midfoot or the proximal part of this knuckle. And the sesamoids have stayed where they used to be, but the, but the big knuckle shifted over here. So we have to correct that knuckle and bring it back over the sesamoid bones under the foot to prevent arthritis and prevent pain. And the only way really to do that is with surgery generally when this is this kind of a deformity. 
and it's acquired over time in this case. So the bone has been cut here and held in place and reduced, and then the soft tissues are realigned at the end of the foot there. That would prevent this arthritis from getting worse over time. So hammer toes are bending at the top of the little toes here, and that can happen for genetic reasons or bad shoes. And sometimes the ligament in the arch or the knuckle will actually rupture, creating this deformity and making it worse. Um, shoes can do it, and then um, and, and genetic deformity or neurological problems can do it also. And when it's neurological, they're called claw toes. So make sure when you're measuring shoes that it's one thumb's width beyond the longest toe. That's not always the big toe. Sometimes it's the second toe. The conservative care for it is using what's called a butin splint here or a metatarsal pad or bigger shoes that accommodate that. So this is the butin splint. You can get this in the, in the drug stores that carry shoe appliances or foot appliances. And this is called a metatarsal pad, which helps to pull the padding back in the normal place and kind of settles the toes down. <clears throat> Operative treatment involves uh, making an incision on top, taking away part of the bone and then pinning the toe in most cases and keeping that pin in place for about four to six weeks. A neuroma is an inflammation or a bursitis between the knuckles, and that neuroma is an inflammatory sac which is created on the, on the nerves, and it can be between the second and third toes or third and fourth toes, but rarely between the fourth and fifth toes. And again, it comes from bad shoe wear or genetics or trauma that creates inflammation there, and patients will have clicking or numbness going into their toes in some cases. So we normally inject that with a corticosteroid right into that neuroma and get that pad in place that we talked about, that metatarsal plaid and, and a wider shoe with a little bit of stiffness to prevent that from getting worse. And that's, that helps in most cases to avoid surgery in about 80 to 85% of cases. It's hard though when people don't wanna change their shoe wear or, or go along with some of these changes, the problem will come back again. So we don't wanna keep injecting it. It doesn't work forever to keep doing injections. So surgical incision involves taking out the neuroma that occurs uh, pretty rarely. It swells for six to 12 weeks and there's some scar that forms in between here which needs to be taken out or just uh, massaged out afterwards sometimes. Heel pain. Heel pain is generally called plantar fasciitis in most cases. It can also be a stress fracture of the heel. It can also be atrophy of the, of the, of the fat and heels. We all get older, your tissue here gets thinner. And from pounding on it, depending on your career and your genetics, people with a really high arch generally don't have a lot of padding here. And that eventually puts pressure on the nerve and starts to rupture this tissue called the plantar fascia. That's why it's called plantar fasciitis. So generally we treat that with a corticosteroid injection stretching, physical therapy, the shoes and the orthotics we talked about that absorb shock and are a little stiffer in the arch to prevent that arch from stretching and tearing with the first step in the morning. If that's not effective, we look and see if they have ligament instability. We, I put them through ankle ligament training for ankle stability because sometimes an old ankle sprain can result in an altered gait pattern which results in the heel pain to begin with. So we have them do stretching and strengthening of that ankle and that seems to get rid of most problems, especially if we are able to treat them with better shoes. And some people need an injection there. These are reasonable orthotics. They're softer. Um, they provide support with the shoe, with a good shoe. Um, they won't work well with shoes without laces always. Uh, generally, you have to have a lace to help to pull the arch up. And they're called Linko or Atrex orthotics, the ones that we talked about over and over again here. Um, a night splint is used sometimes if the pain is worse to get rid of pain with the first step in the morning. And for some people, when we inject them with a corticosteroid, have a really bad plantar fasciitis, we might put them in this lace-up brace to pull their arch up. If that's not effective and the injections don't work, then we consider taking out a piece of the plantar fascia and decompressing the nerve. We're looking to see what the causes of the problem in the first place. Sometimes the cause is a previous injury, which we have to address, or obesity or diabetes and other problems. So we look at everything as an MD would, not just one spot. Um, the patients, you can use an elliptical device for exercise, non-impact form of exercise to stretch and strengthen. And then we have to resect the tissue sometimes. We have to take out a part of the plantar fascia, open up the muscle here and decompress the nerve that travels on both sides. And that's pretty rare. Uh, usually it's something else causing the problem. We correct that problem. Usually people don't have to have surgery for this. We also get an MRI sometimes ahead of time to look for edema and swelling in these areas. So if there's swelling on the MRI here or pressure, that looks abnormal in the MRI, then we'll address that with uh, other non-operative means sometimes. Ankle sprains are the most common injury in the United States. There are 27,000 in the US per day. And generally these ligaments get ruptured, the anterior talofibrial ligament or the calcinofibrial ligament. And it can be a grade one, which is mild, grade two, which is moderate, or grade three, which is severe. Grade three injuries will wind up with surgery if they're not treated acutely conservatively. And the most appropriate thing to do is get people at 90 degrees in a brace and start 
therapy at about a week or two afterwards. So generally we wanna make sure those patients are actually starting with physical therapy and what's called functional rehabilitation as soon as possible to avoid um, having them go on to develop secondary problems. Having them walk around with crutches and having their foot hang down with an air cast is a really bad idea. So if they can walk on it actually earlier and get them at 90 and they don't have pain, they will do better in the long term. So we recommend, this is an air cast, which we don't like, except for if someone's really way too swollen to get another brace on. Uh, patients are grade one, grade two, and grade three injuries. Grade one is pretty mild. Grade two and three is more moderate. But again, we want to get people at 90 degrees walking on it as soon as possible and start the exercises within about two weeks. Um, if they have instability, then we, we check them with physical exam to see if the ankle comes out of the socket. Um, and we look to see sometimes with other advanced testing methodologies, such as this device or an MRI, if they're not getting better by about four to six weeks. Sometimes if patients have pain in the acute phase, we might get a CAT scan to look for occult fractures or an MRI to find occult fractures. We had a patient the other day who had a pediatric problem who had an occult injury and presented with an ankle injury. And after about two or three weeks, her pain wasn't getting better and she wasn't able to bear weight. So she had an MRI in the initial phase, which found something that was genetic that she had broken previously, which got re-irritated. So, you know, communicate, let us know if you're having pain with weight bearing, we'll look into it further. If the non-operative methods don't work, then we repair the ligaments on the outside of the ankle joint by taking them off and tightening them up. And there's hundreds of different operations. It's outpatient type surgery. We generally stick with one or two routine studies though, routine operations that we do based on research data, which seem to work pretty well. Patients are in a stirrup splint for two weeks and we put them in a walking boot for about four to six weeks and a lace-up brace and start therapy at about two weeks post-op. This is what the internal brace looks like. This reinforces a ligament reconstruction because sometimes repairing ligaments that have been injured a couple of times, they don't hold up. So this device is suture material and then plastic anchors, which reinforces the reconstruction and lets people not have re-injuries. Otherwise they go on to develop ankle bone problems if they keep on turning it over and over again. So if we look at, this is what an ankle bone issue is that if you sprain your ankle a lot and you, and you don't have it treated non-operatively or operatively and you keep turning it, you'll actually break a piece of the bone off called the talus and that won't show up sometimes for a while. This ankle x-ray shows a bruise in the talus bone, which came up at about a year or two after the initial sprain. And this is the MRI depicting that area, which shows a hole, kind of like a cavity in the bone. And that's if people have repetitive sprains and they're not really treated aggressively, or they just have a severe series of sprains, which were pretty bad. And sometimes the blood supply under that sprain or under the bone won't get better, and the cartilage will get soft, and that's called an osteochondral defect. So the way we treat that is by putting a drill underneath sometimes and injecting liquid bone or making poke holes in the top, depending on the degree of damage. But the calcium phosphate injection is called subchondroplasty. So we actually go from the undersurface of that joint and uh, inject that material to get to harden it up. Sometimes we'll do transplant of cartilage and bone, uh, depending on on how severe it is and how large the lesion is also. Patients are non-weight bearing for six weeks afterwards, generally in the cartilage transplant category, but with this calcium phosphate injection, because it hardens up right away, we can let them bear weight in two weeks and they generally can walk on it uh, very quickly actually because it hardens up really fast. Posterior tibial tendon deficiency is the most common tendon in, in, to be damaged in women over the age of 50. Uh, so women over the age of 50 go through menopause, have hormonal changes, and this tendon in the arch will, will stretch out and create a, a flattening of the foot. And actually people show up with pain on the outside of the ankle sometimes, not just the arch. But if they go on to get a progressive flattening of the foot, that's bad because it's gone on for a while. We kind of want to get hold of it before it flattens out. Most patients will have difficulty going down steps and then it'll stretch out and they'll lose mechanical advantage. So we want to get these ones really quickly so that that doesn't happen. They don't stretch out the tendon. And how do we do that? Well, this is a patient who showed up with a pretty advanced on the left side and they have an early phase on the right side. So we generally want really good shoes like we've talked about to try to prevent this in the first place in perimenopausal women, but also uh, to treat it aggressively with bracing like this lace-up brace early on, which I showed in my biomechanical engineering studies in this disease process. If the foot is correctable, put that on for about two or three months, work on therapy, you have a chance of saving it and not needing to have surgery for it. Um, This is the Arizona brace, which is the brace that people move into eventually after that lace-up brace, and it's more rigid and provides more support and prevents people from going on to needing to have surgery. This Arizona brace is custom made, it's really expensive. So we generally trial this one first, see if they're gonna get better 
And if they're going to wear the brace, they can tolerate it before ordering this one, which is very expensive and it's more custom. So surgery to reconstruct it can involve tendon transfers, cutting bone, fusing bone, and people are non-weight bearing for six weeks. This is a thickened tendon, which is torn in the arch. This is what it looks like. This is normal. This isn't normal. And this is despite extensive treatment, but sometimes we'll transfer tendons and cut the bone. Sometimes we'll do a fusion operation. It's called a triple arthrodesis where we fuse the joints under the ankle to provide support and really create a normal tripod effect to support the foot and ankle and let that person walk and try to preserve the ankle joint. Sometimes people show up with a disease that's advanced and they go on to get ankle arthritis and we have to replace their ankle also, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this is an older operation. It's been around for 100 years, but it works great. It's really reliable. Um, we've been doing this for this problem as well as for cerebral palsy, for strokes, for polio for almost 100 years at this point. These are the bones in the foot and all of them can fracture. The heel bone can fracture, the ankle bone can fracture, the midfoot can fracture and we have different treatments for all those items. Generally, when someone has an injury and they go to an urgent care, they'll get splinted, be told to do ice and elevation. What we will tell people initially is if we can take them out of the splint, and it's a stable injury to alternate warm and cold, the rest ice compression algorithm, but alternating warm and cold helps the nerves wake up, helps get rid of some of the pain and swelling early on. Uh, we see them in the office as soon as the ER or the urgent care contacts us. And then we triage if they need surgery at about a week to two weeks, if potentially possible, get authorization for that. Really the key thing in the beginning is to avoid things like blood thinners, like Advil or Motrin, and stick with Tylenol in the first couple of weeks until you know it's okay to be on things like ibuprofen or aspirin. Because ibuprofen and aspirin can make you bleed more, actually, and Tylenol doesn't do that. So it's better to be on Tylenol early on. Uh, patients can have ankle arthritis. They prevent post-traumatic arthritis or rheumatoid disease. In this joint, the ankle joint after an old fracture is becoming arthritis, so the joint's kind of going away. There should be a clear space there. And uh, patients can have an ankle fusion for that. Uh, they lose about 70% of motion, but if people are missing the motion to begin with, or they have diabetes or other issues like dead bone here, they have to have a fusion for it. We can't do a replacement for those patients. Patients with good motion, can do an ankle replacement. This is the ankle replacement that we work with called the in-bone prosthesis. And I've been doing this one since 2007, but I've been doing total ankle since 1997. And patients are generally pretty happy for quite a long period of time. This is a very durable device. Patients are able to do their day-to-day -day activities and even some other activities, depending on the patient. Um, things like skiing and uh, hiking, stuff like that. And they're able to maintain their range of motion. And then the surrounding joints don't become arthritic or have a problem generally. So we get a CAT scan of them ahead of time to map out the parts. And this involves being off the foot for six weeks afterwards in a cast and then being in a boot for another six weeks. So we plan it out ahead of time with these CAT scans and that helps to map the parts out. Patients with diabetes can have type one or type two diabetes. Um, most patients will get neuropathy where they don't feel their feet after about 10 years and lose some sensation. We worry about them standing on devices and getting ulceration or infection that happens really easily in people who don't feel things. So they have impaired wound healing because of their blood sugar and sometimes because of their circulation. So we wanna prevent these problems. So what we recommend in diabetics is to keep their hemoglobin A1C between six and seven, shake their shoes out every day at noon, make sure there's no stones or, or tacks or anything inside. Look at their feet with a mirror every day on the bottom, make sure there's no ulcerations, use cream to keep it moisturized and use deeper shoes like we talked about that don't have any seams to rub on. And then this is called a plastizode insert. This is available over the counter. And uh, this is for patients who lack sensation in their feet from any reason, just to prevent ulceration or infection, but particularly in diabetics who don't feel things. A diabetic fracture can happen spontaneously where the foot swells up. It's called a Charcot injury that involves the bones melting together and they get dis they basically kind of melt. And that can happen at any time for a poorly controlled diabetic, but particularly if you develop tight Achilles tendon and develop obesity. Um, and that's combined with circulatory issues, it could be devastating. This is not an infection on the left, it's just an acute Charcot fracture where the arch and the midfoot bones kind of fell apart. So when diabetic fractures happen like this, this is what that x-ray looks like. It ought to be lined up, not broken apart in this area. 30% have a chance of getting amputated and uh, the costs go up to society. So I developed the plate and screw systems and other operations to avoid that, um, that are custom designed for these kind of problems. Um, when hopefully you don't have to use them a whole lot, try to prevent it actually and treat it non-operatively mostly. 
So there's a couple of different websites. Our American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has a website, the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, meaning orthopedic surgeons who are specialized in foot and ankle surgery has a website as well. And they're pretty educational to look up those items and, um, and to refer to what we just talked about. Um, thanks very much for your attention. This is a cake showing the map of Santa Cruz in the middle there, one of my staff made that for me. And uh, these are my little kids many years ago. Some of those guys in the audience might know them. This is my son, Colin, my daughter, Megan, when they were pretty little. And this is what they look like now. So this is my son, Colin, my daughter, Megan, and this is my, supposed to be my son-in-law as of yesterday, but we had to postpone the wedding. So we put the wedding off for a little bit. So he'll be my son-in-law in a couple months, I hope. So uh, thank you very much again for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you, Dr. Abidi. I actually have a question to start um, off. I, I know a lot of us are concerned about um, elective surgeries right now. If you can um, just spend a couple of minutes and um, talk about um, hospitals, how they're handling surgeries during COVID, if um, they're accepting elective surgeries, surgery centers and all that, please. Yeah, that's a good question. So the state of California put a moratorium on elective surgeries in hospitals when it can affect their uh, overflow capacity for the ICU and their resource management for the recovery room and for their nursing staff. So we can't do any elective procedures that are non-emergent within a hospital. However, um, hospitals like El Camino Los Gatos are not affected by that. They have zero COVID patients. Um, their COVID patients are in Mountain View. And um, the ambulatory centers are able to do surgery in all San Francisco as well as Santa Clara uh, counties and Santa Cruz counties because the ambulatory surgery centers that are disconnected from the hospital don't impact resource utilization. And all the patients having elective surgery in the ambulatory centers all have COVID testing and so does the staff. So, um, and most of the staffs now are vaccinated so that their chance the staff and the physicians like I'm vaccinated and most of our nurses are vaccinated at this point but uh, we're very careful about spacing and testing and, and uh, in this outpatient environment with the low numbers, really it's the risk is almost zero, frankly. And the patients are in and out in the ambulatory center. So that's not a problem in the ambulatory outpatient settings. And it's better if you do have an isolated injury like that to go to a facility like that. So you're not gonna be hospitalized in a place where you may be potentially exposed down the hallway. But most hospitals have negative flow rooms and they isolate those patients who have COVID. The question is, you know, every patient who's admitted is tested, but some people, uh, may test positive after a couple of days and they tested initially negative in an inpatient setting. So only have surgery in the hospital or go to the ER if you have to for an emergency, don't be afraid to do that. But uh, certainly nothing elective right now for, the, for this month, at least for January, most likely. Thank you, Dr. Abidi. Um, another question, uh, what complications can occur with um, uh, total ankle replacement? Right, so that's a good question. So the main things we worry about in the initial phase is wound healing problems and the incision on the front. And that's uh, something we worry about, but that's less likely nowadays because we have different techniques to avoid that. So we don't see that very often, but you can have loosening or breakage of the prosthesis. Uh, typically, um, the more modern prosthesis that are assisted with CAT scan ahead of time, it's more accurate and there's less likelihood to do that. Uh, the wear and tear, it, they can generally last for about 10 to 15 years in terms of the plastic. I've had them in longer than that and haven't had to change any plastic as yet in most of the patients. But generally we look to the older plastics that are 10 or 15 years ago to start to wear out gradually, but we're not having to replace a whole legion of those even at 15 years afterwards. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abidi. Next questions. How many of these surgeries um, do you do uh, per year? Um, it depends. I listed about 20 surgeries there. So we do a lot of them on a regular basis. Uh, for total ankle replacements, we have some of the highest volume on the West Coast. Um, we do about 25 to 35 a year of total ankles. Uh, we do a lot more hip and knee replacements because they're more frequent. There are more patients with hip and knee issues, and particularly knee issues. But ankle arthritis is a lot more rare in the United States. It's more frequent in Japan. But uh, our numbers are actually way up there compared to even the university settings for total ankle replacement. Thank you, Dr. Abidi. Uh, what is the expected recovery time uh, for total ankle replacement? Yep. So we look at graphs and charts that we have for outcomes database management. So we actually track those. And I don't have that in that graph here, but we can put that in next time. But basically, patients score about 50 pre-op and about two months afterwards are scoring about 65 out of 100. And by about six, seven months, they're scoring closer to 85 to 90 out of 100 functionally. So by about six months, you're able to do most of your recreational activities. And between six months and a year, there's some slight improvement noted. So patients after a year or so feel like they're completely recovered, but some feel that way by about six months. 
Thank you, Dr. Abidi. Does one need a um, uh, physical therapy after um, uh, total ankle replacement? And do you have um, physical therapy centers that you can refer to? Yeah, we have physical therapy centers both in Santa Clara as well as in, uh, in Los Gatos and in Santa Cruz County and Monterey County and San Benito in Hollister that we've worked with for 20 years. And they, they will do physical therapy on ankles before surgery sometimes and definitely afterwards, but um, not always. Some people don't need a whole lot of therapy for it. We will wait to about three months generally to make sure the parts have grown in, but we'll have patients start moving the ankle by about six weeks, but we don't want to do it too vigorously because they can knock it loose in some cases, um, we want them to start gradually sometimes. Thank you. Uh, could you briefly explain uh, what it means when someone like an athlete sustains a high ankle sprain? What is recommended treatment plan for that? So generally for high ankle sprains, patients will twist their ankle outward, their foot turns outward. If you're looking down at your foot, it actually goes clockwise. If you're looking at your right foot, if you're looking at your left foot, it goes counterclockwise. And that's different than a normal ankle sprain. That involves separating those two bones, the tibia and the fibula, and the syndesmosis ligaments that hold those in place. That's different than a regular ankle inversion injury. It's the eversion injury. And that takes longer to get better sometimes and more frequently requires surgery in the acute phase. Thank you, Dr. Abidi. Next question. Can you discuss where the inc in incisions are generally for different ankle surgeries? Yeah, for total ankle replacement, the incision's right in the front. And for other ankle surgeries like ligament repair, we do ankle arthroscopy and look inside with little incisions on both sides. And then there's a larger incision at the end of the ankle joint on the outside, a utility incision, where we do to expose the outside of the ankle joint. For Achilles tendon surgeries, it's in the back, just a direct incision in the posterior part. And they're defined incisions that we use regularly based on the blood supply of the ankle joint and the skin around the ankle. Thanks, Dr. Obidi. The next question. I had a partial tear to my left Achilles tendon in April 2020. I am currently under the care of podiatrist and his treatment has been for me to wear heels 24-7 and cantaloc injections. Is there other treatment you recommend? I walked yesterday and I have pain today. Yeah, it depends on where the location of the Achilles tendon problem is. If it's in the mid-substance of the Achilles, doing Kenalog injections can be dangerous because you can result in a rupture. Um, as far as wearing heels are concerned, that'll take the stress off it, but that won't really cure the problem. Um, I, I generally get an MRI and see how much Achilles tendon damage there is and where it's located and then guide the treatment accordingly. Sometimes we'll put people in a walking boot for four to six weeks, but if more than 30% to 50% of the Achilles is torn, uh, cleaning that up and actually uh, sewing that up in the operating room and injecting it with platelet-rich plasma is better. Injecting with steroids into the Achilles tendon is not my favorite thing to do because it can result in a rupture of the tendon. Thank you, Dr. Abidi. Next question. What's the difference between normal and high ankle sprain? Mm -hmm. Normal ankle sprain, the foot turns inward. So if you look down at your right ankle, it, it goes uh, counterclockwise underneath your body. And a high ankle sprain, your foot, if you look down at your right foot, goes uh, clockwise, it turns outward. And the counterclockwise ones, the high ankle sprains are much more devastating to the cartilage and the ligaments and require surgery more often. It takes longer to get better, it's a higher surgical incidence. The inversion injury where your foot turns in or goes underneath your body uh, can be treated non-operatively in the majority of cases, but they both require attention. They shouldn't be blown off because we have something called incompletely rehabilitated ankles in which people show up six months to a year later and if they were addressed acutely in the, in the initial phase, they generally do a lot better and require surgery a lot less frequently. Thank you, Dr. Abidi. Looks like that's all for the questions um, today. Uh, great presentation and thank you all for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us at info at orthonorcal.com or, or call um, the office directly at 831-245-4024. Um, the webinar recording will be available on our uh, website as well as our social media platforms. Um, so uh, please check back uh, for upcoming webinars as well. And uh, have a great day, um, rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Abidi. Yep, thank you very much. Hope you guys got something out of it. Take care. Have a good MLK day. Thanks. Bye-bye.